Richard, the question of, is this the end time? Is there a moment when the human civilization will be over? Is something that's obviously asked by theologians over the years, but increasingly so by scientists. Now, you and some others have come up with some fascinating statistical analysis which bears on this question. How, how does that work? Well, this started with a trip I made to the Berlin Wall yeah. in 1969. People wondered how long it would last. Was it a permanent fixture of modern Europe or would it disappear in the near future? Um, so I was there with a friend of mine and I made the following prediction. I said, look, I'll use the Copernican principle. It's the idea we use in astronomy that your location isn't likely to be special. Mm -hmm. As we've discovered, we do not live in a special place at the center of the universe. We're going around an ordinary star in an ordinary galaxy in an ordinary supercluster. So our location is not very special. Um, the Copernican principle works because out of all the places for you to be, there are many non-special places right. and only a few special places. Right. So you're likely to be at one of the many non-special places. So I made the following argument. I said, I'm here looking at the Berlin Wall. I'm somewhere between the beginning, <laughs> uh, the beginning and the end of the Berlin Wall. And if my location isn't special, there's a 50% chance I'm in the middle two quarters. Yeah. Um, and if I'm at the beginning of that middle two quarters, then there's one quarter that's passed already and three quarters in the future. So the future is three times as long as the past. Hmm. On the other hand, if I'm at the end of that middle two quarters, I got three quarters of the past and one quarter in the okay. future. So the future is one third as long as the past. So uh, there's a 50% chance that you're within the middle two quarters, you're between those two limits, and that the future of the wall will be between one third and three times as long as it's passed. That's 50% likely. 50% chance of that. Right. So the wall was eight years old at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I said to my friend, look, there's a 50% chance it'll be, it'll last at least two and two thirds years. That's eight divided by three. three yeah. But less than 24 years, which is eight times three. three. Yeah. So 20 years later, in 1989, I called him up. I said, Chuck, um, turn on the TV. Tom Brokaw is at the wall. They're bringing it down today. You remember this prediction that I made. So it came 20 years later within the two limits. And it could have been far outside these limits. It could have lasted for thousands of years. Or it could have been gone in a millisecond if, if there was a nuclear blast right, sure, in Berlin sure. at that time. So when this turned out, I thought, well, I should write this up. <laughs> so um, when scientists write up predictions, though, we like to be 95% correct, not just 50% mm -hmm. correct. So um, how does this argument change? Well, it says that if you're looking somewhere between the beginning and the end, there's a 95% chance you're in the middle 95%. In other words, not in the first 2.5% not in the last two and a half percent, but somewhere in this big 95% region. So two and a half percent is one fortieth. Two and a half percent is one fortieth of the total. So if you're over here at this limit, then, then uh, this one fortieth has passed and 39 fortieths are still in the future. So the future is 39 times as long as the past. On the other hand, if you're way over here, still within the middle 95%, there's 1 40th in the future and 39 40ths in the past. So in that case, the future is 1 39th as long as the past. So the 95% confidence prediction is mm -hmm. the future of the thing you're looking at will be between 1 39th and 39 times as long as you've been observing it in the past. Okay. So... I thought I'd apply this to something important, the future of the human race. <laughs> We've been around for 200,000 years. That's back to mitochondrial Eve. That's mm -hmm. our species, mm -hmm. Homo sapiens. Well, 1 39th of that is 5,100 years. Mm -hmm. So this says we'll last, 95% sure, we'll last at least 5,100 years, but less than 39 times that, or 7.8 million years. Mm -hmm. So we'll last somewhere between another 5,100 years, but less than 7.8 million years. Now, that's very interesting because it's calculated solely on our past lifetime as an intelligent species, 
But interestingly, that gives us a predicted longevity of between 205,000 years at the short end <laughs> and 8 million years at the long end that's quite similar to other mammal species yeah. that are here on yeah. Earth. Their mean longevity is 2 million years. And Homo erectus, our previous species, lasted about 1.8 million years, and the Neanderthals, they lasted about 300,000 years. So these numbers are quite similar, and yet the calculation is only based on our past longevity. So it should give us pause that um, our past longevity suggests that we may be in as much danger as these other um, uh, species. Now, this assumes some sort of a normal distribution uh, of, of probabilities, right? Well, no, it assumes that you're just you're just observing at some random time during the human uh, during the human species existence. Um, the uh, the population goes up and down, and the Copernican principle says that you're likely to live in a population peak because most people most mm -hmm. people would. Mm -hmm. Goes mm -hmm. up, comes down, so where are you? You're likely to be right. in the peak. Where the peak occurs, that could be r random right. in the right. in the history of the human race. So um, the best predictor that we would have, having no actuarial data on other species, if we had actuarial data on a number of other intelligent species, we might hone it down better mm -hmm. by assuming we again, weren't special among other intelligent species. But we have just our own intelligent species to look at. So arguably then, our past lifetime, this Copernican argument, gives us our best estimate as to what our future longevity might be. And it's uh, soberingly short. <laughs> Although I should point out that the estimate's quite interesting because a number of people have made estimates far shorter they say there's a good chance we'll go extinct in the next 100 years, many people. Um, if that's true, we'd be very unlucky to be at the very end. Other people say we might live a trillion years, <laughs> so we'd be very lucky then to be at, at the beginning. So uh, the Copernican principle warns you that you're more likely to be typical, and so more observations are made by in the typical location, so that uh, we should take quite seriously, for policy purposes, um, uh, these uh, uh, future predictions. So if our estimated species survival time is in this, is bracketed with a 95% yes. uh, confidence level, uh, that perhaps we should take some steps to uh, uh, to uh, 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 propagate the, the human race uh, uh, away from Earth. Well, yes. Uh, one of the things that you notice is that the we're having this conversation on the Earth. <laughs> this is not good because um, if we don't colonize off the Earth, you and I are entirely typical. Everyone born right. would be born on the Earth. If we colonize the whole galaxy, you see, in the future, you and I would be very lucky to live on the very first planet when there were like a billion planets that we yeah. colonized. So it, it warns us that if, if our observations are typical, there's a significant chance that we would get stranded on the Earth. And it's better to have more locations. Um, the, the Greeks put all their books in the Alexandrian <laughs> library. And they, burned out. <laughs> they guarded it very well, but yeah. eventually burnt down, despite their best efforts. So the only reason we have seven out of the 120 plays that Sophocles wrote is that we stored some copies elsewhere. Mm. So it's a great life insurance policy for <laughs> us to plant a colony on, on Mars uh, because uh, that would give us two chances. <laughs> and so right now, I mean, there's lots of threats. There's threats from new viruses that come up. And remember, the thing that causes you to go extinct is by definition something worse than what's ever happened to you before. So really bad virus could come along. Um, comets are coming into the solar system. If we don't have a space program up and running at the time, they could get us. So these are like big icebergs. So we're kind of like on the Titanic and we've got no lifeboats. So we should have some lifeboats. It's smart for us to spread out. And we don't have all that much time because the space program itself 
is not very old. When I wrote this paper in 1993, the space program was 32 years old. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, it'll last at least 10 more months, <laughs> but less than 1,250 years by the same argument. So the space program is very brief relative to our whole species. So the danger is that we'll simply grow bored funding it and we'll quit the space program at some point, like the Egyptians quit building pyramids at some point. And if that occurs before we've colonized, well, we're stranded on the Earth and uh, we're subject to all the other extinction events that are, that are common to other mammals that cause them to routinely go extinct on a time scale of two million years. Um, and we know that disasters like this occur because if you visit the fossils in the right. museums, you'll see that Tyrannosaurus rex was the well, greatest, yeah. most <laughs> dangerous thing. Everything was yeah. afraid of it. It only lasted two and a half million years. Asteroid got it. Right. Um, so um, it behooves us to spread out. This is one of the reasons that we have this um, um, idea that exploration and wanderlust seems to be built yeah. in our genes. Well, it's a good strategy. Spread out and multiply. And so I think this, the importance of the space program is all about survival. Uh, it's a, it, colonizing in space would increase our survival chances. And this is something we should be doing. We have the ability to do it. It'd be foolish not to.